Remember in the prior election, Joe Biden got 51% of the vote, Donald Trump 46% of the vote. Uh, why does this matter? Because of these swing states, Brian. Yeah, so here's the difference on the national poll. Trump, despite 91 charges and four indictments, is a choice, even when you break it down, of the majority of the American public so far as we look at it. Yeah, when so we look at the battleground states, this is the key. Yeah, so a little bit of a recap right here in Nevada. Uh, Trump, uh, Biden won this by three points, a couple thousand uh, separating Georgia and Arizona. And then you got uh, Wisconsin that he won by one point. You got three points in uh, Michigan. And then you got two points in Pennsylvania. Right, right now, this is the only place that Biden's winning. How extraordinary is this? Georgia is suing him, by the way, uh, after the way he acted after losing the election. I'm talking about the president of the United States. And so the people of Georgia say, I'd rather have him than Joe Biden. But there are some mulligans, some, some uh, outliers that are really going to mess with this race. Well, because you got some folks that are going to just want to be disruptors in the race. They outside really the major party. Outside the major party. So RFK said, look, I tried to do it within the Democratic Party. I, I, I tried to work with you guys, but y'all pushed me out, so now I'm in. Apparently, he's getting 24% support in six swing states, Brian. Right. Does He said, I don't even want to run as no labels. I'm going to run as RFK Jr. And we'll see. I don't even want the green label. This is the highest mark for an uh, independent candidate since Ross Perot, before he dropped out and got back in. Since the early 1980s, there's been a systematic attack on our middle class, and the coup de grace was the lockdown. The lockdown was the biggest shift in wealth in human history, and I'm going to tell you about that in a second. And I blame President Trump for the lockdown. Uh, is there any more consideration to a national lockdown to keep people in their homes? I don't think so. Uh, uh, essentially, you've done that in California. You've done that in New York. Those are really two hotbeds. Those are probably the two hottest of them all in terms of hot spots. Uh, I don't think so, because you go out to the Midwest, you go out to other locations, and uh, they're watching it on television, but they don't have the same problems. They don't have, by, by any means, the same problem. Uh, New York, California, Miami, the governor's doing an excellent job. Governor DeSantis uh, in Florida. Uh, we have some pretty hot spots in Florida, too. But we're uh, general in the state of Washington, of course. But that was largely, if you look at it, it was one nursing home that had problems like you wouldn't believe. So no, we're uh, working with the governors, and uh, I don't think you'll, I don't think we'll ever find that necessary. So now, a lot of people will say, a lot of people say, and President Trump gets blamed for a lot of things that he didn't do and he gets blamed for some things that he did do. But the worst thing that he did to this country, to our civil rights, to our economy, to the middle class in this country, was a lockdown. Now, President Trump, in fairness, let me just make this point, will tell people, well, the lockdown wasn't my idea. It was my bureaucrats rolled me on it. I was saying we shouldn't do it. But that's not a good enough excuse. He was the President of the United States. In hotspots across the South and West, we've seen slow improvements from their recent weekly peaks. Arizona's weekly case counts have dropped 37 percent. That's a tremendous drop, and the governor and the, the state have done a fantastic job. Down 37 percent. Texas down 18.7 percent. I was there a couple of days ago. And Florida, 21.2 percent drop. So that's a tremendous uh, job that they're all doing. As we begin to contain the virus in these states, we must focus on new flare-ups in the states where the case numbers have risen, including Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Missouri. And I think you'll find that they're soon going to be very much under control. Meanwhile, 18 states continue to have very low case numbers and low test positivity rates. Under 5 percent, Alaska, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Montana, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, North Dakota, Oregon, Rhode Island, Vermont, West Virginia, and Wyoming. It's under 5. Even in these states, however, where the virus is under control and at a very low number, Americans should continue to be vigilant, be careful, in order to prevent the new hotspots from 
opening up or any new hot spots from opening up in those states. To that end, I urge all Americans to continue to socially distance, wash your hands, wear a mask when you cannot avoid crowded places, and to protect the elderly. Very, very important, protect the elderly. It's much different. The young children have very strong immune systems. We've learned how strong they are. But protect the elderly. The average age of those who succumb to the virus is 78 years old. That's the average age. It's important for all Americans to recognize that a permanent lockdown is not a viable path toward uh, producing the result that you want, or certainly not a viable path forward, and would ultimately inflict more harm than it would prevent. As we're seeing in foreign countries around the world where cases are once again surging, you have many places where we thought they were under control and doing a great job, and they are doing a great job, but this is a very tough, invisible enemy. Lockdowns do not prevent infection in the future. They just don't. It comes back many times, it comes back. The purpose of a lockdown is to buy time to build capacity, especially as it respects to — with respect to hospitals learn more about the disease and develop effective treatments, as we did in the United States. We're doing very well with the vaccines and the therapeutics. Uh, countries where there have been very significant flare-ups over the last short period of time are Spain, Germany, France, Australia, Japan, and also, as you probably heard, in Hong Kong, they've had some very serious flare-ups. Japan has gone yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, six-fold, six-fold flare-up. It's a lot, but they'll get it under control. In our current phase, we must focus on protecting those at highest risk while allowing younger and healthier Americans to resume work and school with careful precautions. Ideally, we want to open those schools. We want to open them. Trump locked down 3.3 million businesses. And, you know, what did that do? It shifted everything to Amazon. 41% of the black-owned businesses that were closed during COVID will never reopen. Mm -hmm. A lot of those businesses had three generations of equity in them. I drove through Lee Harvard, which is one of the poorest districts in Cleveland, and it was a booming area five years ago. Today, every single one of those stores is boarded up. And, you know, I, I talk to people every day in the African-American community whose businesses were wiped out, and that's what happened. We shifted $4 trillion in wealth from the working poor and the middle class to the super rich in this country. We stripped mine the black community of its equity during this pandemic. And, you know, how do you rebuild that now? That is the big issue for our country. How are we going to rebuild equity in the, with the working poor in this country? If you like this video and you want to learn more about me and the movement that we're building, please go to Kennedy24.com. We had more revenue with lower taxes than we did with higher taxes. You also added $8 trillion to the national debt. Your GOP challenger, Nikki Haley, made that point, saying, quote, the truth is that Biden didn't do this to us. Republicans did this to us. Does so she have a point? We had a thing happen to us. We had the greatest economy in history, and then we got hit with COVID. And we had to keep this this beautiful thing going. And if I didn't do that, if we didn't put some money in, nobody knew what COVID was. Remember, this was a new thing that came in. Somebody said it's dust coming in from China. It came from China. They tried and denied it, or they tried for a little while, and we didn't let it. It came from Wuhan, actually, which now they agree. Everybody's now agreeing that it came from Wuhan. I said that years ago. But uh, we had to do things that were very severe. We had to let some money come out. We were going to, we were on the verge of doing something that was amazing. The, and as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. On May 2nd, 2020, 600 doctors wrote, signed a letter to President Trump begging him not to do, allow the lockdowns. And they said, because at, at that time, all of the pandemic protocols Anywhere in the world, the WHO, CDC, everywhere, the European Health Agency, all says you never do mass lockdowns. It causes much worse havoc and deaths and injuries than if you do the standard protocol, which is you lock down the sick, you protect the vulnerable, and you let everybody else go back to work. Otherwise, you are going to wreak havoc. We were going to 
have energy at a level bigger than Russia and Saudi Arabia combined. That energy was going to be sold to Europe and all other places. The prices would have come down. We were going to make a fortune and we were going to start paying off debt. Instead, we got hit with COVID. People didn't need oil because nobody was driving all over the world. I mean, frankly, uh, it was a disaster. What China did to the world with COVID is something that we're going to get to the bottom of, and they have to pay something back. You know, nobody can pay back the cost of all those lives and all the money that was lost, but nobody can pay back the lives and all of the damage it was caused. Thank you. Yeah, of course. You know, and I wrote, I wrote about it for the, um, you know, on Instagram, I was writing every day. I was citing these economic studies that showed Every point in unemployment, you get you get 37,000 excess deaths from heart attacks, suicides, you know, plus imprisonments. And I was writing about this, and they dumped me from the social. They said that's misinformation, but it was not. But people were saying it. People knew it. It wasn't just me. And we now know, of course, that it's true. There's now study after study, and any every comparison between. The states and nations that locked down, compared to those who didn't, you know, had shown the ones who locked down, the more you locked down, the worse you got. Worse COVID deaths, worse excess deaths. We were going to make a fortune off our energy. We were going to send the energy to Europe. Europe was going to pay us tremendous amounts of money. And I'll tell you, you would have never had the Ukraine monster at all. It would have never happened. Russia would have never got just by sheer force of personality. But beyond personality, mm -hmm. what happened is when oil hit $100 a barrel, and, or, and by the way, it's right there right now again, Putin makes a fortune on this war. You know, everybody said, oh, he can't afford it. If Biden allowed my policies to stay in place, oil would right now be at $40 a barrel and Putin wouldn't be able to afford the war. Sweden's numbers came out this week. Sweden was the only country in Europe that didn't lock down. It had the lowest excess deaths in Europe, which is very predictable. If the nation, you know, the nation that led lockdowns was us and we had the highest body count of COVID on earth. We have 4.2% of the world's population. We had 16% of the COVID deaths at some point, even the media is going to have to say, hey, stop saying this was a success story. We... Oh. But the health issues were almost dwarfed by the economic cataclysm that befell our country. My fellow Americans, Tonight, I want to speak with you about our nation's unprecedented response to the coronavirus outbreak that started in China and is now spreading throughout the world. Today, the World Health Organization officially announced that this is a global pandemic. We have been in frequent contact with our allies, and we are marshalling the full power of the federal government and the private sector to protect the American people. This is the most aggressive and comprehensive effort to confront a foreign virus in modern history. I am confident that by counting and continuing to take these tough measures, we will significantly reduce the threat to our citizens, and we will ultimately and expeditiously defeat this virus. From the beginning of time, nations and people have faced unforeseen challenges, including large-scale and very dangerous health threats. This is the way it always was and always will be. It only matters how you respond, and we are responding with great speed and professionalism. Our team is the best anywhere in the world. At the very start of the outbreak, we instituted sweeping travel restrictions on China and put in place the first federally mandated quarantine in over 50 years. We declared a public health emergency and issued the highest level of travel warning on other countries as the virus spread its horrible infection. And taking early, intense action, we have seen dramatically fewer cases of the virus in the United States than are now present in Europe. 
The European Union failed to take the same precautions and restrict travel from China and other hotspots. As a result, a large number of new clusters in the United States were seeded by travelers from Europe. After consulting with our top government health professionals, I have decided to take several strong but necessary actions to protect the health and well-being of all Americans. To keep new cases from entering our shores, we will be suspending all travel from Europe to the United States for the next 30 days. The new rules will go into effect Friday at midnight. These restrictions will be adjusted subject to conditions on the ground. There will be exemptions for Americans who have undergone appropriate screenings, and these prohibitions will not only apply to the tremendous amount of trade and cargo, but various other things as we get approval. Anything coming from Europe to the United States is what we are discussing. These restrictions will also not apply to the United Kingdom. At the same time, we are monitoring the situation in China and the South Korea. And as their situation improves, we will reevaluate the restrictions and warnings that are currently in place for a possible early opening. Earlier this week, I met with the leaders of health insurance industry who have agreed to waive all copayments for coronavirus treatments, extend insurance coverage to these treatments, and to prevent surprise medical billing. We are cutting massive amounts of red tape to make antiviral therapies available in record time. These treatments will significantly reduce the impact and reach of the virus. Additionally, last week, I signed into law an $8.3 billion funding bill to help CDC and other government agencies fight the virus and support vaccines, treatments, and distribution of medical supplies. Testing and testing capabilities are expanding rapidly day by day. We are moving very quickly. The vast majority of Americans, the risk is very, very low. Young and healthy people can expect to recover fully and quickly if they should get the virus. The highest risk is for elderly population with underlying health conditions. The elderly population must be very, very careful. In particular, we are strongly advising that nursing homes for the elderly suspend all medically unnecessary visits. In general, older Americans should also avoid non-essential travel in crowded areas. My administration is coordinating directly with communities with largest outbreaks, and we have issued guidance on school closures, social distancing, and reducing large gatherings. Smart action today will prevent the spread of the virus tomorrow. Every community faces different risks, and it is critical for you to follow the guidelines of your local officials who are working closely with our federal health experts, and they are the best. For all Americans, it is essential that everyone take extra precautions and practice good hygiene. Each of us has a role to play in defeating this virus. Wash your hands, clean often used surfaces, cover your face and mouth if you sneeze or cough, and most of all, if you are sick or not feeling well, stay home. To ensure that working Americans impacted by the virus can stay home without fear of financial hardship, I will soon be taking emergency action, which is unprecedented, to provide financial relief. This will be targeted for workers who are ill, quarantined, or caring for others due to coronavirus. I will be asking Congress to take legislative action to extend this relief. Because of the economic policies that we have put into place over the last three years, we have the greatest economy anywhere in the world by far. Our banks and financial institutions are fully capitalized and incredibly strong. Our unemployment is at a historic low. This vast economic prosperity gives us flexibility, reserves, and resources to handle any threat that comes our way. This is not a financial crisis. This is just a temporary moment of time that we will overcome together as a nation and as a world. However, to provide extra support for American workers, families, and businesses, 
Tonight, I am announcing the following additional actions. I am instructing the Small Business Administration to exercise available authority to provide capital and liquidity to firms affected by the coronavirus. Effective immediately, the SBA will begin providing economic loans in affected states and territories. These low-interest loans will help small businesses overcome temporary economic disruptions caused by the virus. To this end, I am asking Congress to increase funding for this program by an additional $50 billion. Using emergency authority, I will be instructing the Treasury Department to defer tax payments without interest or penalties for certain individuals and businesses negatively impacted. This action will provide more than $200 billion of additional liquidity to the economy. Finally, I am calling on Congress to provide Americans with immediate payroll tax relief. Hopefully, they will consider this very strongly. We are at a critical time in the fight against the virus. We made a life-saving move with early action on China. Now we must take the same action with Europe. We will not delay. I will never hesitate to take any necessary steps to protect the lives, health, and safety of the American people. I will always put the well-being of America first. Some of your your appearances, and during some of the appearances of one Donald Trump, he, he, there seems to be some sort of mutual respect going on back and forth. Would you, would you weigh in on, on if you have a relationship with them, if you're friendly with them, if you've spoken to them? Where does that lie? I mean, I've known Donald Trump for, I don't know, 35 years or 40 years. I've sued him a couple of times. Uh, I sued him twice to stop him from building golf courses in the New York City Reservoir System. Um, but I always had a, a congenial relationship with him, um, even when I was litigating against him. He didn't seem to take it personally. And then, I, um, and then in 2016, he asked me to serve on a vaccine safety commission, which I agreed to do. But shortly after that, he took a million dollars from Pfizer and, I guess, talked to Bill Gates, at least as Bill Gates claims, and, uh, and, that, and shut down the commission. And he appointed uh, God, Scott Gottlieb to run FDA, who was a partner of Pfizer, and Alex Azar, who was a hand-picked lobbyist, essentially, for Pfizer, to run HHS. And then Gottlieb, you know, ran this 80, $88 billion product through Operation Warp Speed, got it all approved at FDA, and then left the agency and went back to join the board of Pfizer. Uh, and, you know, so that's, uh, I don't think that uh, Donald Trump did a good job of draining the swamp. But the thing is, I criticize that. I criticize his policies. I think he's criticized for a lot of things he d didn't do. And, you know, but I, I criticize him. I commend him for, uh, for talking about un unraveling the empire and his efforts to do that, to, to keep us out of war. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the lockdowns, I think that was a huge mistake for our country. And I think that, you know, the, uh, the medical decisions uh, that occurred under his watch were a bad mistake. And I criticize those, but I don't criticize him personally. And I try not to criticize Biden personally, too. I think, I think we've had enough of that in our country, and we have to learn how to talk to people with whom we disagree and to be pleasant to them, to be congenial, respectful, and kind. First question in the news, Trump is obviously facing yet a third uh, federal indictment, but maybe even a fourth coming with the state, with the state of Georgia indictment. Um, do we have a two-tiered justice system? Is this the Biden administration weaponizing the FBI and others um, to, to take out his political opponent? And then if you have time, um, the border, it's a huge problem. What is a Bobby Kennedy border policy? Well, the border, you know, the, I was down at the border and there's a humanitarian crisis there and it's not good, you know, and we now have the Mexican cartels that are running U.S. border policy. So, you know, I watched 300 people walk across the border 
Only two of those families were from Latin America or Central America, one from Peru and one from Colombia. And in a two-hour period, I watched 300 people walk across. Each one of those people is going to be given a plane ticket at, at our government expense to any city they want in the United States. That's how this crazy system works. And meanwhile, people who are legally trying to get in this country, and 7 million people have come across illegally over the past three years. It's a crazy policy. And each one of them is paying $15,000, uh, ten to $15,000 to the cartels. They are extorted, they're exploited, they're raped, they're robbed on the way up. And the, and the children are lost. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible humanitarian crisis. And, you know, a country without, with an open border is not a nation. We need to close the border. And then we need to open legal immigration in a way that is going to be beneficial to our country. Well, why, uh, why, do, you, why, do, why do you suppose the Biden administration has been non-existent and they haven't done a thing about the border? In fact, rolled back some policies that were frankly working. What do you, what do you think the, the motivation behind that is? I, I think it's baffling. I don't know. And, I, you know, one thing I don't do is I don't try to look into other people's heads. In my Fauci book, I never, you know, I never question why, I never speculate as to why Anthony Fauci did the things that he did. Um, but I, uh, I just, all I do is I enumerate them. I tell what I know, what's discernible. I do not, it's incomprehensible to me why we're doing what we're doing at the border. Some of it just seems like petty politics um, that, you know, we're going to, because Trump liked the wall, um, we're going to make sure that the wall's not completed. And uh, because Trump uh, wanted to bar immigration, we consider that racist, and therefore we're going to do the opposite. And I think it's a very, very harmful policy. And final thought, uh, any any final thought on uh, whether or not Trump is being unfairly targeted by the judge, but various uh, agencies? Well, I, the only thing I'd say about that is that I think, a pro, you know, I'm a former prosecutor and prosecutors have to be very, very careful in our democracy about um, prosecuting former presidents. And the reason for that is you don't want to look like, I mean, one of the, you know, when we broke with England in 1776, one of the, you know, one of the issues that we split over is that oftentimes political opponents of the king would be arrested and detained. And, and we passed all kinds of laws to make sure that that wouldn't happen in this country. At the same time, in a democracy, you want to make sure that government officials are not above the law, that the law applies to every person. So that's a balance that a, a prosecutor has to um, uh, has to make, has to weigh, and you hope that they're doing it in good faith and that they exercise good judgment. And uh, there's, you know, I think that, you know, my impression, and I'm not authority on this because I, I don't, I've never talked to the prosecutors to explore their rationale, but my impression was I was troubled by the New York case. I thought that case was too close to the, uh, you know, kind of a speculative kind of prosecution that it was not, that it seemed politically not motivated. Um, I, again, I don't know. I haven't heard the prosecutor's side of the story and I haven't talked to him. I think the, um, you know, the, the case against uh, the president for, uh, uh, on, on the Espionage Act, I don't like the Espionage Act. I think it's always been politically misused. And then there's other optics problems, which is that President Biden also has these, you know, top secret documents and Mike Pence has them too. And so, it, you know, again, it looks uh, like one side is being prosecuted more, but you know, than the other. And I haven't really looked into it very carefully, but I, it would be, it would be um, that, those would be the issues that I, I, if I were prosecutor, I'd be looking out for. Why you held on to those documents when you knew the federal government was seeking them and then had given you a subpoena to return? Are you them. ready? Are you ready? Can I talk? Yeah. What's you the mind? answer? Can I, do you mind? I would like for you to answer the question. Okay, it's very simple to answer. That's why I asked it. It's very simple to You're a nasty person, I'll tell you. <laughs> Can you answer why you... 
very why simple. Why you held onto the documents? I was negotiating, and we were talking to Nara. Well, I think the problem is number one, he's a bully, and you know I don't like bullies, and I don't think America, you know, that that's part of America's tradition. I think in many ways he's discredited the American experiment with self-governance. Well, I don't think we should ban billionaires. I think you know that's not the way to go about it. Uh, you know, we had a 50-year part of our history, which is called the Great Prosperity, when we developed the American middle class, which was the driver of the world economy. It was the driver of our economy. It created happiness and quality of life in our country. And during that, most of that period, there was a 91% tax on the upper echelon. Right. Well, I don't, I haven't made any endorsement. Um, so I'm just kind of looking, what's, I'm watching the debates, I'm watching what's happening to the primaries. My kids are working for Mayor Pete. Um, my cousin Joe is working for Elizabeth Warren. There are a number of other members of my family who are working for Joe Biden. We have relationships with, you know, very strong relationships with most of the candidates. And uh, I kind of go back and forth. I hear them debate. I love Tulsi Gabbard when she talks about our foreign policy, I think. Um, you know, I'm most closely aligned with her, with her vision for foreign policy than any of the other ones. It's a new Trump feud with Caroline Kennedy. In a new interview, the Republican frontrunner attacked America's ambassador to Japan. Who is our chief negotiator? Essentially, it is Caroline Kennedy. I mean, give me a break, Trump said. She doesn't even know she's alive. Ouch. And look at Joe go. The vice president showed that he's got plenty of energy as he ponders a presidential run. The 72-year-old greeted supporters at a Labor Day parade in Pittsburgh, looking more and more that. like a candidate. You go, girl. Oh. And Hillary's team says they're working to soften her image. She'll appear on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon this week and on Ellen. Last time she was on the show back in really 2007, she and Ellen it, had a bowl off. All right. oh! Before thousands were brutally killed, including Americans. Before Iran helped Hamas plan the attack, killing Americans. Before Biden gave billions of taxpayers' money to Iran. Trump played hardball with Iran. Destroyed ISIS. Kept the Middle East at peace. Kept us out of endless wars through strength. History shows very plainly that evil only respects one thing, unyielding strength. When I'm back in the White House, our enemies will know if you spill a drop of American blood, we will spill a gallon of yours. President Trump, the strength we need to make America strong again. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. You to make the case, you say unity ticket, Trump Kennedy, tell us about it. Look, I, look. I would love Carrie Lake or maybe one of these powerful women to be his uh, vice president. However, I see a very compelling reason. Although I know Bobby Kennedy's terrible on guns, he ain't great on Ukraine. All, but he talks about going after the administrative and deep state in a very significant way, led by the pharmaceutical industry. If we put together a unity ticket of Trump and Kennedy, it would be insurmountable. We would bring over. Many of the populists on the left, many of the people that don't agree, Charlie, with Charlie Kirk and Steve Bannon and Donald J. Trump, but that's what a unity ticket is. And I think we could get two-thirds of 70 percent of the American people and back of what we have to do and taking on the Chinese Communist Party, taking on the deep state, taking on big pharma, taking on big tech, taking on big media, everybody that's trying to – it shouldn't be lost on people. Bobby Kennedy comes on Tucker last week and has a throwdown mm -hmm. interview – and next thing you know, Tucker Carlson's given the bum run, the, the best and biggest show in the history of Fox. O'Reilly wasn't bigger. Megan Kelly wasn't bigger. Kennedy, the top of his game, is not bigger. Glenn Beck was not there. They gave him the bum's rush. Didn't even show him the courtesy of 
of letting him announce this on his own due time and having a couple of shows for his audience uh, to uh, to take care of you know his goodbyes. Game the bums rush, and one of the last big interviews he did was with Bobby Kennedy. That's how much they fear that platform. That's how much they fear the voice of Bobby yep. Kennedy. If you put Kennedy and Trump together, that's the dynamic doing. And, and people understand there's a lot of issues that that separate us, but there's enough that unites us that could take on. The administrative state. Well, I mean, the fourth branch of government, the Leviathan, I think is the number one issue when it comes to policy for the next Republican president, if we're able to win. The Harvard Harris poll, which is Mark Penn's outfit, the gold standard poll, showed 22% also nationwide and showed me at young people under 36 years of age that I'm 10 points ahead of President Trump and President Biden, which is extraordinary. <laughs> And then, the, uh, and then uh, the New York Times Siena poll, which is a very, very powerful poll. A lot of the national polls are about 700 to 1,000 people. The Harvard poll, I mean, the New York Times poll, I think was 3,600. There are over 3,000 people, so it was a really a very, very strong sampling. And that showed that in the eight battleground states that show me a, an average of 24%. With 20, and, and remember, all I have to do is get to about 37% because you just need a plurality. and It's winner take all with the electoral votes. So I need to get to 270 electoral votes. I don't even need to win majorities. I just need to get up to about 37%. And that will put me ahead of the other two contenders. And if I can do that in certain enough states, I can, you know, I will win. Uh, oh, and we have 12 months to do that.